Well, I'm delighted and honored to be hosted uh, uh, at the International Peace Institute. Thank you, uh, as I said, for your hospitality and also your your commitment. Uh, we have had a, a week uh, at the other end of town at uh, Columbia University, but we thought it would be uh, was the right thing to end right here at the IPI, which has over uh, which has over the years been uh, a very important place to discuss the future of the international system, you know, from Morale to David Martin and others. Uh, so, uh, and now uh, under your, your leadership. Uh, so, this panel this morning is, uh, I think, a very interesting panel because we have two very different persons. Uh, Ritz Said uh, is uh, well known to all those who have worked close to the United Nations. Uh, he has been uh, the most outspoken uh, high commissioner for human rights. He played an uh, important role in the implementation of the uh, Rome Statute. Uh, and he continues to be uh, very engaged uh, in international affairs. Uh, it's the belief that it's not enough to understand how things go. It's important to change them. Uh, and I would say Dampi Samoyo from a very different angle as, a, as an economist, uh, you also, I mean, I, uh, I listened to some of your interviews, uh, you uh, say that the, the thread that binds together your various book is human progress, uh, your belief in the human agency. Uh, now you look at it from the standpoint of an economist, which is very different than the standpoint of human rights. Uh, but I think confronting those perspectives uh, will be uh, very important today for this group of diplomats who are looking at conflict at uh, a world that is not going well. I have to admit that over the week, uh, the picture that emerged was not uh, a picture, a very optimistic picture. We uh, looked both at Global governance and at issues of cities and uh, smaller smaller issues and uh, while there are initiatives at the local level that we hope uh, we see uh, the uh, international uh, system as it's as it's described and I'm not sure it's such a system today to be honest uh, we see the international community deserving less and less its uh, its name of community uh, and. In the course of this week, we have discussed the balance between what can be done top down and what can be done bottom up. And uh, many of you have stressed the role of civil society. Uh, we have also discussed the role of business with business uh, leaders. So, uh, my first question to, uh, to both of you, uh, Zaid and uh, Nafisa, uh, would be in this iterating environment. Let's be honest about it. What is the role, what is the agency of individuals, of people who are not institutions, but who can uh, possibly uh, change things? Who are the actors in a world where public institutions are getting uh, weaker and dysfunctional? Who are the actors who are going to stop that slide into a world of uh, where uh, strong eat the weak and chaos eventually in the outcome. Maybe we start with you. Well, uh, thank you, Jean-Marie, and, and welcome, Lavisa, to IPI, even if it's virtual, and welcome to all of you. Uh, I'm delighted to be sharing the stage once again with uh, Jean-Marie, an old friend. Uh, we spent many years together in the C-34 when I was the NAM coordinator for peacekeeping, and, and Jean-Marie was this outstanding at USG for peacekeeping really brilliant, I think, if not the best who's ever served in the post. Um, and um, so the question is a good one. Uh, I was at COP26 uh, in Glasgow, and it was quite astonishing if any of you were there to see the power of Greta Thunberg. Uh, no matter who turned up, whichever president, prime minister, none of them received the sort of welcome that Thunberg received. I mean, phenomenal welcome. The power that this 18-year-old Swede wields is amazing. Uh, the question is, can it be felt in the negotiating rooms? And what was clear to me at home 
is that as you went from the street into the different zones, the green zone, the blue zone, which is where the sort of civil society, the corporate sector was, and then you moved into the negotiating zone where all of you would be or where we would be, uh, that all of the energy was lost. And we went from substance to process and only process, no substance. It's almost as if in the UN, it's, uh, we cannot agree on anything but process, and so that's all we agree on. Um, and the, the disparity is amazing to see, uh, but also to realize the power of one 15-year-old that can galvanize the youth in a way which was astonishing. I mean, in Glasgow, the, 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 the schools told the students not to protest, and none of the students listened. In actual fact, I was sitting because I teach at Penn, I was sitting with a group of uh, academics and we were wondering which university would dare to uh, have her as a student. Because in one way, every university would love to have her, but she could probably turn that university on its head. And so it would be interesting to see where she would go. So yes, we are in a very uh, weak spot. Uh, it, it's not... Uh, beyond hope because it's in the weakness uh, of the international systems, the leaderships across the world uh, that we can find perhaps openings and some sort of regeneration given the perils that we face and the acceleration of the aggregate and the compound problems we're going to face is phenomenal. It's phenomenal. I mean, we can talk about this because we're at 1.11 in terms of where the, we are as uh, in terms of mean uh, uh, annual temperature as a uh, in, in, in proportion to or in, as a ratio where we were not ratio. And <laughs> I have to switch now to uh, uh, in, in terms of where we were in pre-industrial pre times. Um, and we're moving toward 2.4. You know, when we get to about 1.7, 1.8, if you were to believe IPCC, everything begins to break down. The global food systems begin to collapse. Uh, governance structures begin to collapse. And, and then what will hold this planet together? Uh, what will be the sort of central uh, 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 sort of mechanism, the, the centripetal effect that will hold us together? And just a final thought. I mean, if we were not to believe in the agency of the individual, you know, the You'd have to you'd have to take a very sort of gloomy view because uh, looking at just climate change alone, if the small island developing states and there might be some diplomacy to represent walk away from pop. And I don't put it past them doing so because they're getting nothing from it. Uh, and then you begin to see pop collapsing. What then? What, what do we do? WTO doesn't function. POP doesn't function. The Security Council is barely, barely able to do anything. Where do we go then? And how are we going to hold this? You know, do we depend on the G20? The G20 doesn't really function very well either. So, so who then takes leadership? Um, and I think that's I think where we can focus some of the discussion. But at the same time, every time I used to visit a country and I used to feel down about where the country was going, uh, because I felt in many respects of the 40 countries I visited as high commissioner, I felt in many, uh, the senior leadership really didn't care about the worst of the people in the country, the country, the people that the SDGs should cater for, I felt were not being cared for. Uh, but at the same time, at grassroots level, like magnificent leadership, magnificent courage, selfless, and often not people who the UN will bring to the headquarters here, um, but people who are not seeking attention, but are trying really hard to make a difference at a local level. And so there are, I think it's not, it looks grim, it's not hopeless. Thank you. Before turning to Davis, I want to, to push you on one issue. Yesterday, uh, we heard the uh, former foreign minister of Indonesia, you know well, Monty Gawa, and uh, 
we're discussing a bit the sort of Twitter diplomacy of today and how sometimes what uh, he had a very good formula for that. He said sometimes statecraft replaces statecraft, and so uh, we see how a Greta Thunberg can mobilize uh, people, but how do you articulate mobilization with negotiation with the uh, the sense of nuance and compromise that is inevitable if you want to have uh, solutions. Yeah, I mean it, it is it is a difficult issue. Um, you have, for instance, I, I worry that the UN is engaged in too much youth washing at the moment. You know, you have a panel, you have to bring some young person on, and the young person's off, and the young person's on. Just to make to go back to the stagecraft thing, and I think that's fairly obvious. There is a, there is a, I mean, when I was sitting in on the negotiations of COM, uh, and all of you are diplomats, I mean, most of you are diplomats, you understand this very well. Um, you, there is a, there is a skill to multilateral diplomacy. We arrive at consensus because we wield enormous amount of technique. How else do you get 193 countries to agree on anything? Let alone a treaty, right? If all the, the positions, the, the starting positions must be overturned for you to arrive at a consensus. And it requires enormous skill to get to that point. Um, when we were sitting on, when I was sitting on the negotiations, there were some young people here, but it is difficult to expect a 22 year old, 23 year old to understand how one does this. You know, if you're a second secretary, first secretary, you have experience, especially in the multilateral field, I mean, it took me about two years in New York to really begin to get an idea of how one does this. And I was watching some brilliant people in the chair, uh, most especially Philippe Kirsch from Canada. And he was a magician. You know, you, you start off a negotiation, you think that it's impossible for us to arrive at any agreement. And he would bring us to an agreement. And then you begin to learn. And a young person might be exceedingly bright, very uh, gifted technically, but that experience doesn't come easy. And so in our negotiation space, they will not say anything. And I wouldn't blame them. I wouldn't want to say anything because I'd, I'd feel stupid if I didn't know how it works. So, so there is this difficulty in trying to have, you bring a technical skill, but there's a lot of experience in how you blend it into policy and find the right track in. And I sometimes see this with my law students. You know, they're very good. In engaging in our Socratic discussions, but I, I, I warn them that when they enter a, a big law firm, that if they shoot their mouth early on, they're not, it's not going to be well accepted. So they have to find a way within the law firm to build a coalition, build an alliance, be smart about it, and to get the view of France. But that requires experience. Thank you. I'm going to say to Dambisa, you have had an extraordinary life. You transformed your life. And now I'm asking you how you transform the life of others. Sorry, I just saw that. Thank you so much for hosting me. Um, I'm sorry that I'm not there with you in person, but I'm delighted to be able to engage and talk to you on this very important subject. So I think before I launch into some ideas, I'd like to just remind us of the current backdrop. I know we're all very familiar um, with what's happening around the world from war to social unrest, to the fact that today we now have about 100 million refugees, according to the IRC. We have perpetual and increasing climate risks, threat of deglobalization with the fracture between the United States and China really becoming emblematic of other fissures. Um, I, I'm happy to be in the UK today um, where Brexit um, and the consequences of Brexit continue to dominate. And then you add to that inflationary pressures and the fact that the overarching picture with regards to global growth is a very, very distressing one. So I'm starting here because my main thesis is that I do believe that with this situation and this confluence of problems, which many of which I will say I, I wrote about in my book in 2018 called Edge of Chaos, the bottom line is that I really believe that we are now going to reach for much more pragmatism, but much more science-based and evidence-based efforts 
um, going back to what historically I believe was the basis upon which decisions were made. Why do I say that? I do agree that over the last decade, we have been uh, swayed public policy, but economics and other areas of, uh, of influence, civil society, et cetera, have been swayed by the viewpoints of many people, often young people who have something to say, but perhaps do not have the nuance, the experience or the broader historical context and understanding to offer the important perspective of not just how to identify problems, but importantly, how to resolve and address these problems. And I think that that environment of uh, social activism had an important role to play, uh, meaning that you know sometimes we do need to break eggs in order to make an omelet, as they say. But at the same time, I do think um, the fact that we are now in a much worse economic position and geopolitically, the fissures have become much more defined and aggressive leads me to believe that in a world where there are threats of deglobalization and less multilateralism, we are going to be looking for more pragmatic solutions. And I'd like to just offer two specific examples of what I mean. So let me start with climate. Um, and obviously the ambassador has just um, uh, um, offered some perspective on uh, the urgent and the, the critical and large problem of climate change. But I think rather than um, identify the problem, um, it's really important for us to start off with what we all agree on. I think it's very hard now to find people who don't agree that there's an urgent problem around climate. But I also think that in our efforts to address climate change in a very diplomatic and sustainable way, we want to make sure, and I should have said, I also attended COP26. We want to make sure that we are not prejudicing or disadvantaging people in the emerging markets. Today, 90% of the world's population lives in the emerging markets. We are consuming 100 million barrels of oil every single day, 100 million. The energy price has spiked, and we have now found ourselves not just economically vulnerable from an inflation standpoint, but also security-wise, we have found ourselves vulnerable, which is creating challenges for diplomacy and international community, as you mentioned a moment ago. But also, there are now real questions about the viability of the climate change ag ag agenda. To my mind, this is why it's very important that for problems like energy, as an example, and climate change, we should make sure that we are always thinking about the science problem, the actual aspect of creating energy in a sustainable, cost-effective, affordable way, but also making sure that we understand the importance of doing that in a world where we are generating 50 billion tons of emissions, even when we've been at home because of quarantines. So it's important, yes, to identify these problems. And many social activists have done a phenomenal job in heightening the urgency on these issues. But going forward and looking at the global risks that are emerging in inflation, in slow growth, in migration in a disorderly fashion, we now need to go back to the table in a sensible way to think about resolving these problems in a sustainable way, which to my mind means we need more science, more thinking, more, uh, more uh, intellectual horsepower um, rather than just emotion um, to drive some of the agenda. Let me, before I, I conclude, offer another example, the global pandemic. It has been clear to me, and I think to many people, I've just in the last couple of days, I've spent time with many um, eminent people who worked very, very um, closely with the solutions, developing vaccines, coming up with healthcare system programs to address the pandemic. It is clear to me that although there were many pledges of a unified global attempt to address the pandemic, we ended up not only with nation states 
um, implementing deferred production uh, um, agreements, such as the United States did, where they prioritize their own needs over other countries. But also, it's very clear to me that the pandemic became an, an issue where people were very focused specifically on the healthcare considerations with not enough due consideration for all the other aspects, social, education, economic, geopolitical, et cetera. So once again, we have a problem that has emerged like climate where the messaging I think has skewed in one direction and has in some sense undermined the broader construct of the impact of some of these challenges. So is as we look ahead, and this is where I'll conclude, and think about the long list of challenges that the global economy and geopolitics and socially we are going to face and we are facing already, I think it's time for a reset in thinking about not just short-term Band-Aid solutions, but thinking about how are we going to come up with solutions that are sustainable and bring as many people along together as possible. We also have to think about making sure that those types of initiatives do not create an us versus them, them culture. The number of um, countries that are today engaged with China, for example, who has become the largest trading partner, foreign lender and investor to all of the emerging markets and is the largest foreign lender to the United States government means that China is not going away anytime soon. Having China at the table as an example is important in addressing the challenges that we face. And so this idea of fissures and deglobalization, I argue, um, is actually doing us a great disservice. But let me stop here and just leave you with the, the, the view that I do remain optimistic because if you look back in history, what has got us out of these types of problems, wars, inflationary environments, global recessions, et cetera, has been a community of the willing um, where countries and individuals, experts um, and scientists have come together to come up with real solutions that have moved human progress forward. So I will stop here. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Well, uh, thank you for, for that and for your optimism. But uh, uh, I, I will challenge you on one point. You, you say we should have solutions based on science, and I could not agree more. Uh, and actually, the IPCC is uh, the idea that there has to, one has to build a consensus on the world on the facts. Uh, and, and have policies that are driven by, by facts, not by ideologies. But I think we see that there is science and there are interests. Uh, and uh, when you are an oil importing country, you don't have exactly the same interest as an oil exporting uh, country. When you have a poor country, when you have a poor country, you don't have the same time horizon as a, as a rich country. I, I remember discussing in Timor-Leste the wealth fund that was created to manage the, the wealth of Timor. Uh, it was clear that Timor could not manage its resources the way Norway does, because uh, if you have children who are going to die before the age of five, telling them that you need to, telling their mothers that you need to put money aside for 20, 20 years from now, uh, it's not, you have a problem. So I, mean, I just take that as an example of the, of the political tensions uh, that exist. Can I, can I also just uh, pick off on that? Um, so at, at UPenn, we have put all the IPCC data into a series of maps. And the one map that really hits you in the face is the severe heat map, because we do not have a technical scientific solution for severe heat. So wet bulb is what you need to focus on, 100% humidity. 35 degrees centigrade, we humans cannot exist. And you just need to read Kim Stanley Robinson's book, Ministry of the Future, to understand what can happen. And we see recently in India that uh, you're pushing the boundary of what the human being can withstand. So if we look at the wet bulb modeling at 2.4 degree uh, uh, mean annual temperature rise, uh, 
if you look at that map and see how many countries, and many of you come from those countries, uh, by 2050 will endure extreme heat up to a third of the year, so 100 <coughs> days of the year. And you'd be at wet bulb 32, so just short of one heat wave, where unless you have cooling continuously and the infrastructure can support it, millions will perish, millions. And this is at a time not too distant in the future. So just imagine the economics of this. You know, we have the data, it's everyone can look at this, right? And a particular country issues a bond because it needs access to capital. And then you start, you know, having these discussions with pension funds or those who may, might uh, invest. And then they'll say, well, this country is pretty much doomed. I mean, give it a few years. And it's not a country we want to invest in, right? But that country needs to also adapt. It needs to find a way of adapting to these extreme changes that are coming. I mean, if you put wet bulb aside and you look at severe storm surge, I mean, it's phenomenal. We're going to experience in many countries a hundred year storm every between 1.5 a year, 1.5, sorry, one to one and a half years of uh, to sort of eight years. So one hundred year storm between sort of every one to eight years in many parts of the world. And, and countries have to adapt very quickly. And going to the uh, the point, there's no fiscal space in many of these countries to begin to do that. And so we need something really dramatic. The system that we have in place is weak. And can I just touch on two points, bring it closer to the UN. Um, when, I, when I first started the UN, I was 30 years old. I, uh, I was in the UN peacekeeping operation in uh, the former Yugoslavia. And in 1995, uh, we had a change in head of mission. And a gentleman by the name of Kofi Annan came, and I was the most lucky 30 year old, 32 year old at the time uh, because I became his assistant. And from that point on, we were friends, and I respected him enormously. Indeed, I could say I loved the man because we became very close. But I think if, I, if Kofi was still alive, I would discuss this with him because I think there are two things that happened in his tenure which made sense to us because he could put it off. But subsequent secretary generals, I was not sure about. And there were two little events that happened. One, in the Security Council, it had been the norm up, at, up until Putros Radi's uh, secretary generalship, that the 15 members speak, take the decision, then the secretary general speaks. Or the 15 members speak, then the secretary general speaks. And I think it was uh, Richard Holbrook as a president of the council, who brought Kofi in, and Kofi was the first to speak. And from that point on, it's always the Secretary General, and any of you who've served in the council know this. Secretary General speaks, 750 speaks. And then in 2000, there was another event. We were sitting in the General Assembly for the Millennium Summit, and, uh, and the Secretary General was invited to speak, and Kofi came down from the podium and spoke from the rostrum, where we normally speak here. And, and all of us were a bit surprised. We, we thought, you know, what's he doing? This doesn't normally happen. And we didn't think much of it. But later on, I began to realize that there's a problem with this. Because in, its, in essence, the mind separating the secretariat, which is a principal organ of the UN, has a chapter to itself like the General Assembly and the Security Council. The line separating that from the membership was becoming blurred. With Kofi, we could keep the separation. Since then, I think what's happened is that the states, like we see in the European Union, like we see in the OAS, like we see in the Arab League, like the states are far too powerful for their own good, and the Secretary is far too weak. And you, think, you need to think of a, of a sporting analogy. If you take football and take one of the major leagues, yeah, all the power rests with the clubs, with the franchises. They have the money, the star players have the reach, uh, they have the, you know, millions of followers. Um, and if you look 
in most of the leagues, the officials, the umpires, the lines persons, no one knows their names. At the end of the game, they jump onto the metro, the bus, they go home, right? But for the game to function at a high level, all power is invested in those officials. They call the points, they call the penalties, and everyone listens to them. In the UN, you have that. There's a form of, it's a regulator of soft, uh, let's say it's, it's a soft law, and it's, it's the depository and the regulator of that. But what we've done, if I can put myself back with my member state cap on, what we've done is we've assured ourselves that we have essentially weak referees that we don't listen to. And so the system begins to collapse because we're all fouling in various sectors and we prefer that to actually allowing the system to function properly. And whether it's the WTO, the human rights mechanisms, you know, the Security Council, they can keep going on and on and on. And that brings us back to this question of, of science. Because how do you bring the authority of science uh, to way on the conflicting interests of politics and uh, narrow interests of in various countries. Yeah. But it, they are the great Thunberg of, of this world and we can advocate for science, but that may not be quite enough. Yeah, I, I, I think that's, that's exactly... Can you sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, sorry. Um, so I think, I think that's right. And I think it, it does definitely um, the question of, of how do we move from sort of heretics and ideology to a practical implementation, I think is, is at the center of this. Um, you know, I, I feel very fortunate um, in the sense that I do inhabit multiple uh, sort of areas that um, actually are dealing with the same questions, but from different perspective. So for example, in terms of <laughs> I serve on the board of an energy company. I'm on the Oxford University Endowment Investment Committee. I'm, I was born and raised in Africa. Um, and so, uh, you know, these things are very important to me. Um, it's interesting to hear the comments that I hear a lot. People are going to die. Millions are going to die. You know, I grew up on a continent where millions have been dying um, for a whole host of reasons, um, disease, poverty, war, um, for several decades, and it did not seem to be um, that materially important. Um, all of a sudden now, uh, there, there are real questions that we have to address regarding energy transition that, as I said, I have not yet met anybody anywhere, not in a boardroom, not in an endowment space, not in public policy, who doesn't believe that this energy crisis is urgent and it's enormous. But in order to solve this problem, I do think it needs an injection of realism. Um, you know, the pledges coming out of, uh, of COP, uh, previous COPs, um, but also G7, G20, around $100 billion to be sent uh, to emerging countries are not being met. And they simply end up being pledges because there are economic constraints and challenges. And I think we need to imbue these conversations with some level of seriousness um, and also realism. Um, just to the point about science, you know, I, I do think, as I mentioned, that um, heresy and ideology and social movements have their role. But at, at the end of it, as I mentioned earlier, problem identification is only one half of, of, the, of, the, of the solution. We need to come up with real solutions. And I'm happy to say that, you know, although I worry that a lot of the social movements and the, um, the, uh, the um, public policy discussions tend to err on um, uh, risk mitigation, which is important. I'm, I'm thinking about the energy space and climate change. Um, they focus on the emission caps, net zero targets, scope one, two, and three, all critically important, but that's not going to solve the fundamental problem that by some estimates, there'll be 11 billion people on the planet um, by 2100 that need access to energy. We are already in a situation where there are a billion people who don't have access to energy on a sustained, uh, you know, reliable uh, and cost-effective way. My parents who live in Zambia are a classic example of this, educated um, with great work and job uh, and careers, but it doesn't matter because you're still not going to have access to energy. You face load shedding. So what is the solution? The solution is yes, of course, risk mitigation is critical. 
but we also need to think about investing into these issues in a sensible way. When you think about the energy stack, I think it's much more of much more utility for society to not just think about defunding companies or trying to um, you know, focus on net zero. Let's also think about what is viable in terms of the energy stack. So when I talk to investors or on board calls, we're looking at solar, at wind, geothermal, biofuels, nuclear gen four, batteries. I mean, the list is quite extensive. And there seems to me that there's a much more sensible conversation that needs to occur around carbon capture, greenhouse gas emissions, trying to move the needle away from just us navel gazing at what these problems are. So that's where science plays a role because I do think that um, moving this conversation into the pragmatic issues of second order effects, migration because economies are collapsing, those are all extremely real. But I also have a lot of faith that we can address a lot of these problems if we actually have the temerity, but also the humility to think about these problems in a much more holistic way and not just think about risk, but also think about opportunities. And that brings us to the role of uh, cooperation. Uh, uh, in this uh, seminar, we have discussed what uh, Mutar Kent uh, called the golden triangle between public institutions, civil society, and business. And we have uh, heard business people saying that it's a good thing that they are doing with their companies. Uh, I know you, you are, as you mentioned, you are on several boards of important uh, companies and you have published a book on the, what a board, uh, how the board should, should operate. Uh, so there are lots of expectations vis-a-vis -vis, uh, corporations, but also, let's be honest, lots of suspicions because uh, uh, it's a really two-faced uh, two uh, issue. Uh, how, do, how are we going to have uh, corporations which are good citizens of the world, so to speak? And what do you see uh, the, as the role of corporations in facing the challenges that we're discussing now? Yeah, thank you, Jean-Marie. I, I really appreciate you asking that question. Um, and I think it's really important because there's no doubt about it that capitalism, globalization, and corporations more generally. I would say since the battle in Seattle in 1999, I, I don't know whether many of your audience uh, were, were, will remember that, um, but this certainly has been over a decade of negative um, and I would say disparaging um, a commentary about, um, about the role of, of business and corporations. And um, part of the reason I wrote my most recent book, How Boards Work, um, was really to reassert the important role that business and corporations play, not just in providing a tax base, um, not just in employment. Um, in the United States, for example, you have companies like Walmart and Amazon, millions of people that are being employed. And, but it's not just um, about those two areas, as well as innovation and R&D, which we saw occur during the pandemic, real um, you know, rollout in terms of manufacturing and delivery. Um, but I do think you've raised the important point that we should be able to see in the 21st century, a broader role for corporations in addressing everything from climate to inequality, to um, inflationary challenges and things that, uh, that, uh, that I highlighted earlier. The good news, um, and even in my just 10, 12 years of being on corporate boards, there's been a material change um, in, in not just the narrative, but in action on social issues and, and a whole host of economic and geopolitics that, uh, that we are uh, talking about here. Um, of course, there have been some milestones. 2019 in the United States, you have the Business Roundtable setting out its new stall, saying that they no longer will prioritize um, uh, sort of financial uh, shareholders, um, but we will now broaden this utility function to think about uh, stakeholders. So to my mind, um, again, we should not be throwing out the proverbial baby with the bathwater. Clearly, corporations can do more. Clearly, corporations are doing more, um, and there's a lot more to be done. And I, I think that it's a tragic narrative um, that has emerged, but hopefully 
um, with the response that we saw during the pandemic, we'll start to see um, that, that corporations are there to really should be there as partners um, in public policy. You've seen, if you look at the Yale survey um, that Sonnenfeld puts together, there are now over 1,000 companies that have, have voted with their feet and left Russia. Um, we want to see that, we expect to see that, and I think we will see a lot more of that as the world continues to navigate this challenging time. Good day. What's you? Yeah, I wish I, I wish I could be as uh, optimistic as you, Gabi. I'm, I'm afraid I'm not. Uh, I was sitting at a discussion with colleagues at Penn from the Water School and the Climate and Energy uh, uh, Center, and they were saying the same thing to me. And uh, one of my colleagues who's involved in climate said, "Well, you know, we've known about climate since the 1960s, and this belief that the markets will take care of everything. Well, they haven't." I mean, we are at a perilous point, and to believe to believe in in the markets when they brought us to this point at the edge of a of a schism, I think is sort of delusional. In in many companies, we still uh, feel that the talk about ESG is perfunctory. It's still in the washing space. It's still in the market space. Not all companies. Some companies, you really feel the penny has dropped, and they understand the full implications of this. But the many still are not there, and uh, and we've seen you know recent actions, of course, taken against Goldman Sachs and, and other investors on account of greenwashing, and I think uh, that is the norm across the board. It's not persuasive. Uh, when I go to countries that are imperiled by climate change, and you say, well, what's the private sector doing? What are the major investors doing? Practically nothing. Practically nothing to help these companies. They won't do anything until they see a profit, you know, somewhere in, in, the, in the sort of investment. The idea that you can move beyond sort of corporate social responsibility is still a dream. It's still talk and it's not really happening. I think also there is a problem from the climate uh, side. I mean, I, I was talking to a senior advisor at BP and he said, you know, BP wasn't invited to Glasgow. You know, you have huge uh, industries that weren't invited because, as you said, they've been sort of, uh, you know, they're the villains, essentially, and, and so they're not brought in. I think that's a mistake. I think they do need to be brought in. Um, and that the, the, they have to, we have to go beyond the marketing phase. I, I'll give you an example. I mean, I was talking to a minister of the environment about climate and um, and when I was showing the client, the minister, the data, you know, they couldn't get their head around this. And this is where we go to the, the, the science issue. They couldn't get their head around how in peril they are. They were still thinking of marketing. They were still thinking, what could we do to sort of you know, present our people with a win for the next election cycle? Not the fact that in 15 years' time, the country is going to be in deep, deep trouble. So that the science should agitate a response which is filled with solutions, as you were saying. The problem is that it can either lead to denial, but we don't want to think about it, or can lead to panic, which means it's too late and we're all going to be at each other's throats. I, the, the critical thing is leadership. Who is going to lead all of this? Right? And, and the point that I was trying to make is that normally it should be the Secretary General of the UN. It's the only universal body they, they should be empowered to really leave and help us find the connections. Um, but if we decide that the Secretary General should be weak, uh, the leadership should be weak, then we are adrift on, on so many issues. So I think it's a combination of finding strong leadership at the top and finding grassroots leadership as the energy supply for solutions. I do agree that, I mean, we need to stop having panel discussions about what's happening and why is it happening. But, uh, the, you know, actually practical solutions to address what is going on. You know, and I think if I look at the common agenda, I mean, with all due respect to our colleagues in the, in the Secretariat, when uh, a, one of the proposals is that most countries need to rewrite the social contract, well, if most countries or many countries are polarized, how does the UN propose one does that? A constitutional amendment, which is the normal procedure, would be crazy. So is it citizens' assemblies? Is it referenda? You know, the idea of just putting something out but not giving an idea then to how does one do 
is where we need to actually have this migration. So I agree with them. So we need to go stop thinking about the what and the uh, and and why it's happening into into just focusing on the harder issue of how. <coughs> For the UN, it's going to demand a dramatic change because it means going from process to substance. To avoid, you know, substances, it's very dangerous. Sorry. I, I, I would just. Are you muted? <laughs> you not hear me? Yes. No, 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 we do. We do. Okay. Um. So you know, I, 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 there's a lot in there. Um. I don't know why, uh, the, you know, or maybe I should say, I think we should be a bit more sanguine about what's going on. <coughs> there's 50, 53 trillion dollars, which has been earmarked. I'm not saying that it's perfect because obviously we've seen what's happened at DWS. We, you, you've talked a lot already about, um, uh, about some of the pushback on greenwashing. You know what, that to me is what we want to see. But at the same time, why are we giving governments a free pass? The governments were also there in the 1960s and 1970s. I'm not gonna sit here and say, you know, corporations um, couldn't have made better decisions. I think we all could have made better decisions. I mean, Rachel Carson was writing decades ago on these issues of, uh, of, uh, of climate, but I do think um, you know, it's dangerous in some sense to, uh, you know, to, and I'm not saying you're doing this, but I think in general, there is a narrative, these corporations are bad, they're not really doing anything. And I think that leads to exactly what you pointed out, lack of participation at these key watering holes like COP26, precisely when you need to have multiple stakeholders, multiple viewpoints, not just you know, so civil society and government, but also the private sector. Um, but you're not going to get them there. They're, they're being run out of town. And you know, it seems to me that we are giving a, a free pass to government. Um, we do need regulation. We do need, I would say, more transparency on carbon pricing. Um, I think a world which is very reactionary, um, often found in, in places across Europe, that tends to be very rules-based. Um, and you know, we've seen it time and time again, break down and cause problems. Um, I think we want more principles-based and we are starting to see that. The SEC is now coming up with some ideas. Let's engage, let's figure out what can actually work. But I mean, the notion that there should be no notion at all that corporations are doing nothing. Um, I can tell you, we have a fund in the business that I'm involved with, it's over $400 million and it's growing. Um, I know that, you know, JP Morgan and many other companies have come out specifically. But, uh, but Tabiso, can I interrupt you just? If you go to the climate vulnerable countries, do you see any of that money? Do you see any of the money going into the climate vulnerable countries? I, I, I don't know. I, I can't say, yes, I went to uh, Mozambique and I saw a project. I don't know. But I, what I do know is oh. that I think it's it's also unfair to, to not acknowledge that we have governments making pledges, $100 billion. Where is that money? That's coming from the public markets. Um, that has not been seen either. So I, I think we, we're probably on the same page that there needs to be much more unilateral, or should I say combined um, effort from from everyone to address this problem because it's so big. But I think, um, and may it may be the case that us spending time uh, picking out, you know, who's doing better or worse is probably not much utility for this conversation, except to say that uh, that there's a lot more that needs to be done in a very urgent timeline. Uh, I get worried. I don't know the UN system. Uh, I am worried hearing what you're saying about the Secretary General, um, not just because of climate change, but because of Ukraine and Russia and other challenges. Um, but I can tell you from my experience, I don't think it's true that nothing is being done. Could there be more? Absolutely. And I'd love to hear what those ideas are, but I think telling people saying that we should defund companies is not to me a, a viable solution, especially as someone who was born and raised in Africa, I want real solutions to create energy so that we can have education and healthcare um, as you do in the West. I'm going to open up to questions in a minute and maybe we'll have questions about the solutions. But before that, I want to add an additional complication, <laughs> which is that China was mentioned and the need to involve China. And certainly on climate, if China is not part of the solution, it's, uh, it would be a big problem. At the same time, you know, there are major issues of human rights uh, with, with China, 
Uh, uh, so there is a real dilemma there, and really the question is for the two of you, how one balances the public good of addressing climate change in, a, in an effective way, and the public good of making sure that human rights improve around the world, including in China. So uh, when I, a difficult fight. Well, when I, uh, uh, I had my second interview, uh, for the position of High Commissioner for Human Rights. It was with Ban Ki-moon, and it was just Ban Ki-moon and myself, and I was one of three on a short list. And Ban Ki-moon said to me, okay, uh, look, uh, I had two trips to China. On one trip, I did raise human rights, and I was attacked roundly by the human rights community. And on the second trip, I raised human rights and I was attacked by my Chinese host. And he said, so how do you deal? I mean, not just with China, but with countries that are going to be hostile to any suggestion that you raise the issue of human rights. And I thought it was a good question. Um, and I didn't really have an answer for it. Beyond the fact that what you do from a human rights perspective, is to raise the obligations which a country has voluntarily took unto itself. No one told the country to accede to one of the human rights instruments. All countries, all 193 member states of the UN have acceded or ratified at least one human rights treaty. None have withdrawn from the mechanism. No one has withdrawn from a UPR, right? So we accept that there is a universal human rights system. There are universal norms. There's a, a entry into force procedure. There's a standard. There are obligations. Everything is accepted. So what we were doing is basically reminding countries of their own obligations and saying, you did this a few years ago, you ratified. So why are you not living up to your obligations as per the demands of your own people? And, uh, and of course, they would react very strongly because when you're in that space, you meet our bodies to say, between a government and its people, it's very sensitive. But we think it's healthy to be in that space because it's like a company. No company would survive, proper company, unless it were or organization, unless it were audited internally and externally on its financials. And with the same can be said of countries as well on, on the rights conditions. And, uh, and their countries, I think all countries can point to some positive developments, uh, a positive delta. And almost, I can't even think of a country actually that doesn't have a problem that needs to address. And many have sizable problems and others are less so. So with China, it was always a case of, it's not a singling out of China. It's a case that China has real issues that it should not avoid. You know, China was always telling me that it has red lines that I could go to across the red lines. And I said, but all, all the issues I want to discuss are across, across the red lines. But it's the same with uh, other countries. And we say, you know, what we say to you, we say to the Europeans, we say to the Americans, the Russians, you know, the Arab state, my own country, it's the same. So there's no sort of singling out. And the fact we have a UPR, I think, helps in that context. Um, but the one thing that I, I do, I think, feel very strongly about is that what I think is very distressing is that in many countries, uh, what you see it's the willful exclusion of a part of the population in a way that's really quite dramatic and very sad. They could be an ethnic group, a religious group. It could be, you know, Afro-descendants. So we at the UN, in this context, 70 years of working together, and we have the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, but we all suffer from racism or colorism, or some sort of discrimination against the, the minority. And why haven't we been, been able to solve it? Why isn't there a model country that we can point to and say they've actually found a solution to it? You know, we, why are we struggling with this? Why are we not more just, you know, as Bill Clinton said in 1999, that when we sequenced the human genome and the differences between us are, are infinitesimally small. And yet those differences seem to account for racism, bigotry, chauvinism, and discrimination. Why? I mean, it's phenomenal when we think about it. We have to solve it. 
have to find a solution for it. Because that's what leads to, if you look at most conflicts, they're not boundary disputes. They're gross human rights violations that lead to conflict. And it's not extreme poverty. It's not even poverty, uh, or let's say income inequality. And you have many countries with income inequality where you don't have massive violence. Actually, the UK is the country with probably the largest income inequality. What you have, though, is if it's income inequality with persistent discrimination, structural discrimination, that's when you begin to see conflict. And that's what materializes and metastasizes into something much greater. So we have to go to the heart of it and fix the discrimination issue. None of us want to be discriminated against where we come from. I mean, we can't control where we are born, the color of our skin. And so I think this is something that's really material to try, to try and identify how we get out of this mess that we're in. Thank you. Lapisa, do you want to say a word on that before I open to quick to QA? Well, I think it's very funny um, to, uh, to uh, have this conversation when uh, the president of the United States is on his way to Saudi Arabia. Um, so it goes back to the points earlier made about leadership. I don't think anything that uh, was described a moment ago is, is sort of earth shattering. I think in many respects, it's motherhood and apple pie. Yes, I mean, everybody would like to live in a free society. I'm sure George Floyd would have loved that too. Um, but uh, the fact of the matter is when it all comes down to it, it's about real politic. Um, and, and by the way, I'm not at all saying we should throw our hands in the air and give up. But I think, a good, again, this is where pragmatism and realism steps in. Um, and uh, again, just from the perspective of the corporate space, I won't comment about the UN or other initiatives around uh, from government, but certainly in the corporate space, um, there has been a material effort to now quantify in a very transparent way the efforts um, to try and redress areas um, such as uh, discrimination that's been outlined. Um, I think there's a lot of work to be done, like most things. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, certainly as someone who serves around the, the boardroom, I once again try to make every effort to take lofty, big visionary goals uh, that, uh, you know, most of us will subscribe to, to make them break them down into practicable um, areas where we can actually make real efforts. Um, because it clearly is the case um, that therefore a lot of the issues that we're addressing today and talking about here, there's been a lot of talk um, and certainly not much action um, that can be uh, can be tracked and, and monitored. Here, here I disagree because there are lots of people in prison. Oh, there, I, there are lots of people in prisons around the world. I was talking about large multilateral institutions. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. I'm saying we're talking here, the United States, which is supposed to be the emblem of freedom, um, stand in values. The president is going to see the, the premier, the, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia. I didn't hear any comment come out of the United Nations or any most of these large multilaterals to condemn it or to at least highlight how, um, you know, how inconsistent that is in the pursuit of, of human rights. Yeah, so, the, the, the U.S. is actually outside the most of the U.N. human rights framework. It's not. It's not party to most of the conventions. I, I'm but not it, it's, referring it's, to conventions. I'm just saying, in general, the United States. I think if you polled people, they would say it's a country that goes around and does st stress values and human rights, and has been. You know, that's part of the. You yeah. asked about China. That's part of the, the consternation with China is about human rights. And so there is something uh, worth probing if the American president sees that there is a price uh, to give up on human rights, which is an oil price at $130. Um, and so I think it's a bit more complicated um, than, than what we see. But you're absolutely right. People are dying all the time um, in the interest of, of human rights.